Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this video net webcast where today we're talking about how service providers can own the smart gigabit home. Obviously we're talking about homes that are sitting on the end of one of these wonderful new access networks that can cope with gigaban, uh, gig gigabit broadband, so not necessarily a new access network but upgraded whether it's DOCSIS 3.1, Fibre or maybe even GFAS. But today we're not really focusing on the access network itself, we're much more interested in how we transfer those speeds into the home and get them into every corner of the, of the home where they may be needed for some new services, whether it's IoT or smart home or, or maybe better entertainments. Um, we're really um, interested in the sort of the disruption potential of the gigabit era. Um, it's a great opportunity for, for service providers who get it right, but there is also the potential for another OTT moment because we could see multiple retailers all send in their own uh, smart home services, uh, sort of dedicated services with their own devices even, and um, potentially that could disintermate intermediate the service provider if they're not careful. So one of the main things we want to investigate today is how the service provider maintains primacy in terms of the customer touch point, maybe making sure that their devices remain the primary device in the home, given that there will be some retail options available, and whether there's a role for them as an aggregator of services or potentially as the guarantor of quality of experience and what kind of opportunity that provides for them. Um, we will take audience questions during the course of the, the hour, so do send in your questions um, using the console. Just uh, type your question and press submit. That will come through to me. We'll stop at least twice, if not three times, for audience questions. Uh, and we have, uh, as I say, an hour, so I won't uh, talk for any longer, and I'll just introduce our panellists. So first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Charles Cheevers, who is the CTO for Customer Premise Equipment at ARIS. And we also have Michael Inouye, who is Principal Analyst at ABI Research, <clears throat> who I'm sure you've uh, all heard of via sort of uh, market forecasts and updates and that kind of thing. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. And um, the first question is to you, Michael. And really what we want to know is the services that are currently driving this demand for gigabit speeds. I mean, we, we know that gigabit networks are coming. There's a lot of effort going into that. I mean, what are the services that will drive this? All right, thanks. Um, so there are a number of drivers uh, for the growing need for increasingly robust data pipes. Uh, some of this activity is coming from existing services and broadcasts that are simulcast and multi-screen, of course, and TV everywhere. Um, but there are also a number of new factors to consider as well. Um, so 4K uh, is certainly one of the future drivers for uh, data consumption, but so too the expanding levels of live OTT streaming. Um, there are also changes to uh, viewing behavior, such as binge viewing, for instance, uh, can make viewing patterns seem uneven uh, with peaks and valleys. Um, there's also individuals who have either cut the cord uh, or never had to pay TV service. Um, so for these households in particular, you know, we might see several concurrent video streams, uh, which puts additional strain on the network. Um, but it's important to note that I'm, I'm not talking about like a mass exodus um, from traditional pay TV, pay TV services. Uh, it's quite the opposite, actually. Um, uh, there's, these, these same operators, of course, can have uh, could target or will target these individuals, be it core cutters or core nevers. Um, you know, through OTT services, um, their own OTT service that may uh, be similar to their pay TV platforms. And this could be something like Dish Network, uh, Sling TV, um, or Sky and Sky Now are our two examples. Okay, Michael, but just also put your slides some... to the audience now as well. Okay, great, appreciate it. Um, there's also uh, live streaming events that are starting to get more popular as well now. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, for each major streamed event, uh, this could be something like the Olympics, uh, this past Olympics of Rio, um, this often sets the tone for future live event viewing. So future events often come at that level or higher uh, if following each of the previous one. Uh, so with regards to this faster in the market, uh, we're also looking at new sources of content as well. Uh, there's eSports, for example. Uh, which in some cases has drawn larger audiences uh, than traditional sports. Um, and there's also live concerts and performances. Uh, a little bit more nascent area is live mobile streaming. Um, so you have services like Facebook, uh, Periscope, YouTube, and a number of Chinese social networks. Um, they've had an impact uh, to multiple areas, including live performances um, and even the dissemination of news. Um, monetization, though, in that area is going to be a little bit of a... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, what, um, when you talk about 4K, are we talking about 4K on every screen, first of all, sort of 4K right around the home, presumably? 
Um, 4K right now is more to the primary uh, the primary screen so far. Uh, right now, just because of the you know the installation of 4K screens panels in, in the home, there aren't really many or very few of any uh, mobile 4K screens, uh, phones or tablets. So, and in most cases, the homeowner will you know if they do buy a 4K TV it's for the primary set in that previous HD set, which was a primary, becomes the secondary and third tertiary TV. So right now, it's still more just the primary set. Um, but you know, in time, as more devices do get 4K resolution, it could uh, extend to multiple screens. Okay. Your, your slide refers to virtual reality. I mean, how big a deal would that be? I mean, we, we're all getting quite excited about it. But is, that, is it the next big thing in entertainment? Right, so I would say if you're going to say what's the next big thing beyond the you know, traditional OTT viewing, um, it's going to be still more 4K and HDR. Um, but if you kind of view that more as an evolutionary step that coincides with the overall growth of the OTT, then VR could certainly be viewed as the next significant factor. Um, so VR is going to be hitting both traditional gaming and, of course, video. Um, but um, as you can see from the slide, so just kind of go over the slide quickly. Um, we have a forecast at the top uh, that looks at the different VR HMDs by categorized by type. So you have the VR tethered, um, which includes solutions like Oculus, Sony's PlayStation VR, HTC Vive, um, and some other upcoming uh, solutions like Acer and Starbreeze's HMD. Um, so in these cases, these uh, HMDs require an external process unit, like a PC or a console. Um, and there's also a tether. So the tether right now is wired, but in the future, this will be wireless. Um, okay, the largest now. mobile uh, segment is the mobile. Oh, sorry. Sorry, just finish. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say the largest is the mobile, um, so that's the processing done either in you know, the mobile device, um, and that could be like the Google Cardboard and those kind of things, the lower end pricing. Okay, now Charles, you've got a slide here, and just talk us through these next two slides. This is your view on the drivers for speed, I think. So tell us what's going to drive the demand for these gigabit speeds throughout the home. Sure, John. Um, obviously, from the Access Network perspective, Networking has always been a burst um, technology. It's not sustained, right? We, we, we want instant gratification. So that's why speeds of 500 megabits or gigabit speeds on the access network um, are good, right? We can get a, a web page downloaded quicker. We just like to do stuff in one second attention spans, three second attention spans, and less than the time it takes to sort of shuffle in the chair or make a cup of, a cup of coffee, right? We're getting more used to that speed. Um, so when you when you when you see the operators move up to higher speeds, right, it's, it's to get a better user experience overall. But that that then has to hit the home and has to be distributed across the home. And obviously, as Michael said, new services drive those um, uh, requirements. So I'm often asked, you know, how can you take a gigabit into the home because no, no device, uh, wireless device, for example, typically can process a gigabit of speed. That's somewhat true, but certainly with new um, devices, particularly high-end tablets and ultrabooks, um, the 2x2, 3x3 radios and those devices are getting closer to being able to uh, suck in almost a gigabit speed themselves. So again, for that user experience, the customer is buying a higher-end device, expecting it to uh, be better on the wireless network in the home. There's also the, I, th I believe um, that, you know, number of screens is going to increase in the home too because the, the technology of producing flexible OLEDs or uh, the, you know, the investments that's going on by the TV companies to produce screens at lower price is going to make those screens more um, prevalent in the home, every room having its own screen console area, right, whereas not every room has a TV currently. So to feed those in multiple ones, that's what this slide tries to illustrate, right? There's lots of devices in the home. There's kind of three bands of radio that we think are important uh, to get that gigabit speed throughout the house and intra room and and uh, outside the room as well. So the typical one is obviously 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, with 5 gigahertz being the faster uh, frequencies that we try and put all our video over, 2.4 getting us a bit more range as we move around. We also see the addition of uh, IoT devices. Now, IoT devices tend to be more chirpy, and lots of them that they're just saying, I'm, I'm open, I'm closed, or whatever. Not really huge bandwidth drivers, but certainly need latency, um, need really good low latency um, uh, support. So that's why the burst network is good, too, then, and that we can send the houses on fire message from a sensor okay. very quickly to the network to process. And then finally, the 60 gigahertz band, which uh, we think is uh, ripe for being uh, used, John, in, in, inside the room particularly, although interesting enough, there's some leakage outside rooms too that can also be leveraged as well, we think. 
Okay, now I'm going to show the next slide now, which is the poten potential bandwidth drums. But just referring back to that first slide first, I mean, it sounds like there are devices coming that will suck more bandwidth. They're not there yet, but we're going to have a sudden moment where devices are in retail that are just going to be, become hungrier. They have the capability yeah. to suck in more bandwidth. Yeah. So that's exactly what uh, this slide tries to illustrate, John, as you know, right? So we, so we look at today, if we look at sort of, say, a cable operator particularly, right, there's still a lot, a lot, most of their video is delivered over QAM. So what the bottom kind of candlestick on this one shows that if, you know, if, if you um, look at UHD streaming and camera usage in general, it's still, you know, less than peak of uh, 20 megabits per home. Um, if you switch QAM to all IP, then it gets it up to about 25 megabits a second, that's assuming 2.2 concurrent users in the home, for example. And then if you, if you switch it up again to uh, um, HD IP video to UHD IP video to 4K, then we're hitting up to uh, 60 megabits a second in the home required at peak. Now, that 60 megabits is a long way off gigabit, but when you think about how all the stuff is 90% of connects are over Wi-Fi, the ability to be able to burst on the network and be able to buffer a little bit to deal with the vagaries of Wi-Fi is an important thing. Many of the audience out there know that you know IP video is a buffering segment and buffer thing. So the, the faster you can fill up the queue in these set-top boxes or, or the gateways to send them, the more tolerance you have of, of any Wi-Fi issues in the home so you can keep that smooth streaming. So what I show here particularly is as you switch to um, all UHD IP video in, in the future, for example, you're hitting almost 75 megabits a second a peak in the home, and then if, as you introduce um, mm -hmm. some upstream uh, capacity as cameras move from you know, 400 kilobits a second to full uh, 1080p to HD to UHD, even 4K cameras, they'll trickle up some bandwidth upstream, which will be you know, so somewhat significant in that couple of um, you know, two to five megabits maybe from cameras for anybody who's on vacation or whatever. But then the big numbers come in in 8K, for example. So 8K HDR is about 100 megabits a second of strain on the network. So again, in the future, if we have lots of 8K walls in the home, for example, those will be burning 100 megabits. And then what I show in here, which we're going to talk to a bit later, and, and Michael mentioned, is that VR is very interesting, right, in that we think it'll probably stick a little bit more than 3D did because it has natural um, uh, you know, check marks for things like first-person gamer, uh, applications much better than a VR experience. Uh, John, uh, Michael mentioned education, um, adult content. Um, there's all sorts of um, sort of user experiences that are improved with VR. Um, and v I'll, I'll touch on it later in terms of the bandwidth. But you know, without without clever video processing, an entire immersive 4K P60 90 90 hertz kind of VR experience could be as high as 500 megabits a second. And technologies are going to bring that down with some clever um, uh, technologies uh, bringing those down, but that's that's definitely between AK HDR and VR. We definitely need to start building some really good, you know, gigabit level speeds and potentially leveraging 60 gigahertz for that um, 25 gigabits of capacity that it can do in a room. Okay, let me stop you there, Charles. I mean, Michael. Um, I mean, that that looking at the sort of the Wi-Fi capacity we have in homes today. I mean, that looks fairly scary. I would think for for most service providers. I mean, do you think that Wi-Fi could become, you know, like a a dreadful bottleneck for for services and for gigabit once we've got the access networks right. Um, and for I mean the current situation with cloud consumers, I mean especially if they go say with a retail route or something like that, um, there's pot there's chances where the technology may be kind of legacy old out of date. They may be only on as uh, Charles said the 2.4 gigahertz. They don't have the upgraded to AC or A5 gigahertz. Uh, Frequencies, um, but there's also also issues just related to the buildings or the homes, the construction, the placement of the router gateway. In the case of there's only one access point, um, so there's lots of other kind of variables that can play into it as well that can affect the performance of the network and the Wi-Fi connection. Um, there's also cases um, even where you have additional <coughs> network extenders, um, you know, to help address dead or weak spots. Uh, the potential still exists uh, for that. Some, what some people would call like sticky clients. Um, it often happens with uh, maybe a little bit of older uh, mobile devices. Um, so it, it has a tendency to sometimes connect or remain connected to the first access point. And then as that user moves around the house, um, if that access point no longer becomes you know, the optimal one, then they can turn into what some people call bad apples, and that could reduce the overall network capacity in the network. Um, so there's definitely cases where not just having the technology there, but also cases or opportunities for active network management, and that could be something that could be you know, viewed or seen as a, a differentiator for Wi-Fi, premium Wi-Fi. Um, 
And there's also other things you can do to help, you know, as more of a premium kind of feature to improve and address some of these networks. Um, for those who only have one maybe one access point, you could add other extenders. You could add a hybrid wired net wireless network, um, and of course, you know, upgrades to the AC and, and an AD for in-room connections. Um, I mean, do you think? I mean, could I, this become a yep. differentiator? I mean, if you're a service provider who, you know, takes care of Wi-Fi, you invest now and you do this well. Could that differentiate you from your peers? And you know, is it something that you can go out there and market and say to consumers, well, look, we've got premium Wi-Fi. You should come to us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's such the marketing part is interesting because a lot of consumers aren't really um, quite as savvy, you know, with all the different nomenclature with Wi-Fi. I mean, if you advertise, you've got multiple user MIMO and those kind of things, or even if you go to the generations of N, AC, and AD and those kind of things, the consumers don't may not resonate very well with them. Um, so if you can identify more of their use cases, the number of devices they have connected, um, and you know the challenges they may face, um, especially if you have something where you could. Uh, monitor the network and address the specific areas that may be having problems. So, you know, if the user says, I go to my bedroom and my, you know, my Wi-Fi doesn't work very well and my, you know, my Netflix isn't working. So if you can identify that and then, you know, maybe that would require uh, like a multi-hybrid wireless adapter kind of uh, thing into that room that will increase it or uh, better that performance and experience. And then that's something where that would resonate with consumers and it's something you could sell as a premium kind of feature for, you know, again, monitoring and controlling and making sure that the experience is what they're hoping or what they're hoping or expecting to get from their uh, their service. Okay. And Charles, do you, um, I mean, are we on the point where we're going to move beyond a single access point world into a multi-access point world? I mean, is, the, is that the only way that we'll achieve these kind of speeds for Wi-Fi? Absolutely, uh, John. I think uh, there's two elements to it, and Michael touched on a very important part of it. One is the physics of wireless connection. So if you look at this, for example, we are moving towards, you know, the primary access point won't be able to deliver um, everywhere in the home as we move around and as more screens get added for bedroom uh, bedroom viewing and, and so forth. So the we are improving things like we have the 802.11ax um, uh, wave to come in the next uh, from 18, 2018 onwards. Is we try to improve efficiency of Wi-Fi in a very congested environment, right? Promising potentially four times the improvement of current Wi-Fi in, in congested environments, particularly when you have all the X clients. Um, so that's going to be a while until that happens as we work in mixed mode. But in the meantime, we think about you know typically about you know 30% of homes really can't. Um, take a, a good enough um, video over Wi-Fi signal to the far reaches of the home without the use of adaptive bitrate. Today we've been living on the ability of adaptive bitrate technology, streaming technologies, to ratchet down the bandwidth to the consumer. And the consumer generally is okay because the streaming continues, um, but they don't get the highest quality. So as we start to differentiate with HDR and higher tier video particularly, as that moves over Wi-Fi and over IP, um, you know, somebody is going to pay for a pay-per-view, for example, you have to give them the quality at 25 megabits a second or whatever. And to take 25 megabits a second throughout the whole home reliably, well, it doesn't sound like a, a gigabit. You probably you need to build a gigabit platform because of that bursty nature of networking, the, 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 the importance of buffering and making sure you have enough, you know, 2 to 10 seconds loaded in the set-top to keep that, you know, 25 megabit a second, bit per second um, stream going. And so eventually we come to this kind of architecture where we have a device in every room. So initially we think about 30 to 30 something percent of homes will need a second extender, but ultimately we're going to something like this, right, where potentially things like 60 gigahertz drives it to every room because 60 gigahertz is more of an in-room technology with some scope to deliver bandwidth outside. So having a wireless pop or multi-node device, uh, micro-node device across each room with the ability to connect wirelessly both your your your, your surfing speed, your uh, TVs, no HDMI cables, your VR headsets, and be able to uh, deliver you know not just one gigabit but even you know five gigabits of current uh, 802.11 AD levels today, and with AY coming up at promising 25 gigabits to really be able to burst into the home high quality video. But just w w one point about the software side, and as Michael mentioned, right. All this stuff has to be controlled, so even with one extra access point, let alone you know six or seven of these pops in your home, you have to control them with software. So certainly, uh, companies like Aris ourselves, we're looking at uh, bringing some of the, um, 
the solutions that have been in the enterprise market in terms of managing Wi-Fi in large buildings where people walk around and, as Michael mentioned, sticky client. The idea in this home, too, would be a software solution in the, in the background that's managing the optimal link as you walk between each room and making sure you're on the right access point. And even in today's terms, we're bringing solutions for just single access points, uh, one extender, two extenders, as we move towards this architecture. And we're also doing a lot of Wi-Fi analytics because one of the things the operators need is they need to be able to give these multi-access points to the consumer before they ask for them. You don't want the consumer phoning up saying my Wi-Fi sucks and then have to send out an extender for a range problem. You want to be proactive on that. So some of our products like our eco product will mine the data set from the home and figure out that the consumer actually could do with an, access, an extra extender because they're seeing mobile devices that are modulating at the lowest modulation levels for Wi-Fi for 50 or more percent of the time, which typically indicates that a range extender would be, would be a good idea. Um, Okay, well, I've just put another ahead. slide up now, which is looking at uh, more the impact of virtual reality, really, on, on this kind of architecture in particular. So, I mean, first of all, why have you focused on virtual reality as a kind of like a, you know, specifically in terms of architecture? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you that in terms of, uh, so Michael mentioned tethered and untethered headsets. So most of the HMDs today have a HDMI cable connected to them, or some of them even have HDMI and USB 3.0 cables. And the reason they do that is that they're actually been sent uh, uncompressed video, HDMI, from a games console or a PC, as Michael mentioned. That's not a great user experience. So we know it's going to go untethered, and we know it has to go wireless. Um, now, if you look at the bandwidth of, so this architecture here shows a potential, well that, the, the, the bandwidths then are for current kind of, you know, uh, Samsung uh, gear, uh, untethered experience, right, at 720p, it's maybe up to 14 megabits a second. So your LTE or your your um, Wi-Fi connection to your head can actually give you, you know, some kind of reasonable 720p experience. But your brain is not fooled, right? You have 15 minutes of that and you tend not to feel too comfortable, right? The simulation sickness that everybody hears about. Um, so what you do is you, you have to, if you just go back one again, John, please, just to uh, just highlight sure. the, the, the big, sorry, the big, uh, the big ticket number. So what, I, what I'm showing here is that for pure immersive 4K, right, we're looking forward in the future sometimes. There's no 4K headsets at the moment, but most of the experts in the space recognize that if we have, you know, 4K resolution, HDR um, contrast and color, and we have, you know, 90 hertz, we're talking about something like uh, 576 megabits a second for a 360-degree stereoscopic environment. Now, we won't be sending that quite that much because there's technologies that will um, compress that down that I'll talk to you about in a minute. But that's, that's why VR has been looked at, right? It, we think it, it is a sticky application. There will be first-person gamers and lots of gaming. Um, augmented reality, too, we've seen with Pokemon Go. So that can only get better, and I think there's def definitely a big enough of a niche to, uh, to drive it further than 3D uh, was. If you go back to the other slide, your, the next slide then, John, just to to highlight the, the nearer term problem of VR, we'll say, right? So you have the, the chain of VR is obviously content creation with lots of cameras. You have to store it somewhere. Michael mentioned even sending VR from live sports is typically unicast because everybody, everybody has a different view on the game. You can decide to look at the left player in tennis or the right player in tennis, the scoreboard. So that, that's actually quite a lot of bandwidth that has to come out as well. There's new compression and coding and mapping technology. So there you see, rather than use a 360 sphere, people are looking at mapping to cubes and pyramids, which can save up to 80% of the bandwidth, and that's going on. But if I just focus on the here and now for just the, 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 current, solution, the current solutions for VR, download a large file to a gaming or PC and send that to HDMI, through HDMI to a HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift. And it's amazing the numbers, right? We're seeing anywhere between uh, 6 gigabytes at the very low end and 100 gigabytes of file size at the high end for uh, these immersive VR games and experiences. And at, at 100 megabits a second, which is quite a good broadband connection these days, you know, a 100 gigabyte file for a first-person gamer would be um, 2 hours, 30, 23 minutes to download. So we think that's not a good user experience, right? We're back to those, you know, these big files for even just current day VR kind of gaming, let alone live uh, streaming, uh, also will place demands on the network and potentially some of the popular games will end up, end up getting multicast because the, the operator won't want to send, you know, a million copies of a 100 gigabyte file to a very popular new distribution in the future. So we think we have to improve the speeds for gigabit speeds to even burst down the uh, file. So you see there at a 
at a 100 gigabyte file at 1 gigabit a second, it's 14 minutes, which is reasonable, right? You go and sort of, you know, do a little bit of uh, house, uh, kitchen work and then you come back and start playing your game. That's not too bad, right? But still, even a gigabit is not able to get down 100 gigabytes at uh, at the speeds that, um, um, you know, uh, is instantaneous playing of it. Okay, well let's um, let's take an audience question now, and then we'll move on to our next sort of main section, which is talking about the role of the service providers. But um, I've got a question from uh, Sylvie uh, Dixtra from TNO, and he's asking, as a, I'll direct this to you, Charles. I think this is probably for you. Um, as a provider, how can you identify the activity in the home per device without intruding with the privacy of the users? So uh, this is oh, a good one okay. for the Internet of Things. Good I question. Think. Yeah, good question. I mean, obviously there's privacy laws and there's abilities to, to opt in, for example, with the consumer. So operators can you know, give the user the, the option of opting in for a better experience or some shared experience or whatever, where they let some of their information through. My, my comment about the Wi-Fi site and using software to control um, the Wi-Fi experience was around using some of the 802.11 parameters. So Michael mentioned sticky client and each device in the home, uh, certainly a new one, so if you take an iOS device or an Android device, the latest one, those devices give away information, right? They give away uh, who they can see themselves, right? So is there other, is the neighbor's access point interfering? Can I see that? Can, what, what number of access points can I see? What's the quality of my uh, connection to my current access point? So what, what I was talk, talking on there uh, about was more about the device device's Wi-Fi connection quality and the ability to use that connection quality to determine if that client should be attached to access point one or access point two and if the ARIS controller makes a decision that, that the access point two is a better access point to connect to because of signal strength or um, throughput or capacity or utilization, we can, we can now f make that happen with some of the technologies that we're developing. So it's not in that sense. It's not really, I guess, the privacy side of it. It's more that we're using new parameters that are being populated by the client's um, ability to give information to the access point and for the access point to sense it, and then using that to create a better Wi-Fi experience in the home. We can obviously look at one of the things we have been promoting is that, for example, in the IoT space for privacy, the cameras are always a big concern. And one of the things that uh, we all know is that every single device in the home has to go through the gateway. So the gateway can see camera traffic in a number of ways. It knows certain ports, it knows certain devices, it knows certain bit rates look like they're constantly going upstream that could only be a camera. So we think that you know the operator and the user and a company like ours can offer a solution to say, I'm home, I want to be private. And when you click our, on that option on your smartphone app that the operator provides, or you say to your um, ambient voice device, you know, I'm, uh, I want to be private, then we can we can stop those flows uh, coming out of the home. So we think we think those um, those solutions of being able to um, help with the with user privacy, um, and then uh, you know as I said with uh, with the information from a Wi-Fi perspective, being able to use those parameters to make a better experience. And if the user opts in to uh, avail of all those experiences, I think it's a, a win-win situation for the user and the operator. Yeah, I mean, we were going to talk about the uh, the security aspect for service providers later, but I'll do it now as as we're on that subject. I mean, is this something that only a service provider could do in terms of guaranteeing the security of devices and not getting hacked into homes and having things turned on and off, or you know, and also the privacy, which is just a sort of a subset of security, I guess. I mean, is that a role that service providers are uniquely able to perform? I believe so. I think I just gave the camera application. I mean, you know, our, our research has shown that people like having cameras on when they're not there. Uh, some people like watching the dog and the kids come home, obviously, and they have the choice to do that. Uh, people love having cameras on when they're on vacation. So when you, when you, uh, but, you know, 20% of people will never turn a camera on because of privacy, right? So there's there's ways, as I said, if, if you have a, a way that you the, the customer feels comfortable through technology and acknowledgement from the operator, that they've been able to provide a solution that when they leave, the billing starts for recording, say, and when they come back, it, it starts again, all guaranteed to have turned off the camera when they get back. Those kind of things could bring up the upsell for for services. I think in the IoT space, I think the operator is best positioned to make it happen in terms of smart home because there is a, fragmenta a fragmentation going on in the market where people go out and buy the best-in-class light device or the best-in-class smart fridge or the best-in-class smart uh, garage door opener or 
or sprinkler system or whatever it is and um thermostats and you end up having this you know 14 fragmented applications on your handset that really don't give you the experience you want where you really want to be able to you know when i come home uh, turn off the cameras uh, also you know turn on the lights uh, you know tune to my favorite tv channel as i sit down on the sofa or whatever the new scenarios of iftt are for an operator an operator can deliver those and in fact i think we're seeing the operators start to to really get serious about doing that kind of aggregation ownership of the home, working in partnership with the top 10 of the top 10 smart home device providers, um, but certainly aggregating that experience into a ergonomic kind of single hub in the home for connecting all the devices, which I think is the operator's, uh, uh, operator's spot to lose. And then... Uh, then working we'll, with we'll those come to that in a second. I'll, I'll ask that to Michael in one minute yes, about this sort of aggregation role. But just quickly, I've got two more questions, um, and they relate directly to what was just asked. So I'll ask them of you now, Charles. And very quick answers, please. I mean, it's again from Sylvie. Yeah. It's uh, a follow-up from TNO. So does that mean that the residential gateway will also be more complex than it is at the moment, meaning that every single device connected to the residential gateway is allowing the throughput measurement? So give me a one-sentence answer on that. Uh, yes and no. Yes, or no one that it's not more complex because we ha we think we have the right size packet processing and controller function for Wi-Fi just to do very simple client steering with the cloud doing all the other uh, high-end complex stuff, right? The, the data analytics-based processing, that shouldn't be done in a gateway, right? The gateway is only responsible for, for making sure the right client is attached to the right access point, and that's a, that's a function we think should reside locally. Okay, and then Brent Bischoff at Cox Communications, I guess might be referring to uh, the earlier answer, is, is, is asking, is the controller in the home or the cloud? But it's, it's both. I think uh, we, we believe that the controller should reside in the CPE for managing client association with the best possible link to the Internet, and that's a closed-loop function that can be managed by policies from the cloud. And the second phase is that we think it's all about analytics. It's about those applications of sending extenders before the user asks for one as a proactive, better ex user experience than today, figuring out if the home has uh, multiple Cox access points in the case of uh, Brent's uh, uh, company, right? If, this, if, if the surrounding access points are all visible or Cox, then maybe there's some cloud function we can do to make the Wi-Fi perform better across that, uh, that kind of Wi-Fi domain. And then also following up on... Uh, you know, constant analytics from the home in terms of the, you know, the the way that the Wi-Fi and wireless devices are behaving is all cloud-based. But the, you push new policies to the controller to say, you know, client steering is a little bit um, a little bit aggressive at the moment. Loosen it up a bit, and we think we'll get a better experience. So it's the, the answer is both controller in the gateway and controller in the cloud as well. Then. Right. Okay. All right. Now, Michael. Um, Charles talked about aggregation role a moment ago. I mean, in this sort of, um, you know, once we get into the smart services, um, automation, security, and uh, all the other things that could come, connected health, et cetera, I mean, will we just have multiple retailers all go in direct to consumer with their own devices, or is there a role for somebody to aggregate this? And if there is, who could that be? I mean, could it be the service provider, or, you know, could somebody else do it as well as a competitor to them who has the power to aggregate? Yeah, so Charles, you said, covered some of this already, and he hit a big point on the, the fragmentation. Um, so there's a lot of players in the retail space who are trying to become that aggregator. Um, you have like Amazon, um, Apple, Google, or Alphabet, um, potentially Microsoft. Um, but they're all kind of coalescing a little bit more around, in some cases, voice. So like Amazon, Alexa, um, and their Echo products, for instance. So they've brought in some other, some of this fragmented parts, so whether it's working like Nemo Lights and those kind of things. Um, so there is some kind of bringing together there um, under one, I guess, kind of an umbrella. But as Charles said, it's still very fragmented. Um, there's also some industry groups um, like the uh, Open Connectivity Foundation, which was, I believe, formerly the OIC. Um, there's Thread Group and All Scene and those kinds as well. Um, so they could bring some commonality to you know the, the communication between the devices. Um, again, it's all kind of still developing though. Um, but I agree with Charles that the service provider, it's really is kind of their their game to lose in terms of being that centralized hub. So if you look at some of the hubs that have been out there, um, a, a big example could be like Revolve. So Revolve was a, uh, a retail product that Google had purchased, and at the time they purchased this, they, they pretty much stopped selling the product, and then just this year they basically phased out the product completely. So if you had bought a Revolve product and you were using it, 
Um, now that product is basically pretty much defunct now. You'd have to replace the hub, and you know, replacing the hub creates you know, lots of pain points and all those kind of things. So for an operator, a service provider, um, they provide some continuity and longevity between you know, making sure, assuring that that product is going to continue to work for you know, as long as you have the service. Um, also, service providers can also provide better customer service. I would, uh, in terms of, you know, if I have a question or I have a problem with something, I could go to them and they would be able to, as long as, you know, the products are either approved or certified or offered by them, they could help you with addressing those issues. Whereas if you have a problem with, let's say, your lights, you call Amazon, they may say, well, that's not our problem, you know, it's Belkin's problem. So those kind of issues could definitely favor the service provider to be that centralized aggregator um, for the smart home and also entertainment. Okay, so does it follow then that that role of being the person that someone can go and complain to if something goes wrong, the service provider could exploit that? I mean, can they become the sort of the guarantor of quality of experience for other people's services, other people's devices even? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a big part of this also is not just not only the questions, but also the installation. Um, so the, for some consumers, the you know, the prospect of having to install all these devices, having to manage, you know, if they're using batteries, if they're being powered, wiring, all those things could be a daunting task. So for the the service provider who already has installers whose expertise, who you know that consumer may be already used to having to come to their home to address you know problems with their set top boxes or networks, um, that's already a relationship they already have. So that's something for sure that the service provider can leverage. Um, they can also do things like, um, you know, offer warranties and so that, you know, ensuring that their product will last for as long as, you know, they have their service, like I said. So, you know, something needs to be updated, replaced, that would happen. Not at the, co- you know, consumers, the bill to have to pay for the whole new thing, but just part of the service uh, maintenance. Okay, so they're, they're sort of consumer-facing um, benefits, I guess. And is there any kind of business-to-business potential, like, you know, do you go to one of these, um, say, the security provider or the, the health connectivity provider and offer them a service level agreement? I mean, is that an option? Yeah. I, I can take um, that one, John. I think that, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. No, you go ahead, Anna. No, no, go ahead. Okay, Mike, no, no, go, ahead, go ahead, first, and then Charles, you come in afterwards. Uh, I was going to say, I, I, w- I would say there definitely is opportunities there uh, to do that. Um, but, I mean, I, as far as you know, what those kind of relationships might look like, um, Charles can probably address that more. Okay. Well, Charles, you follow if up you, then. And, uh... If you jump to slide 13, John, it actually has, it's a graphic that we can talk around. Right? It, it illustrates that particular... Um, okay, that's on now. Um, yeah. So, you know, what we've been seeing in our research and talking to um, you know operators and uh, smart providers um, is that there's kind of two dimensions to it. One... There's the home piece, which we, we've talked about, smart home. But then there's these other pools of money that come in from the cloud side. And so as you mentioned, the three here, for example, the insurance uh, you know, model is very simple, right, particularly for health. So people go to hospital, insurance pays for a number of stays in the hospital, a number of days stay in the hospital, of which maybe two of those are monitoring rather than um, needing you know, all the the cost of this associated with the bed. So there's a natural view of trying to get people to go home quicker and then being able to monitor them. So you send them home with a pack of Bluetooth monitoring devices like pulse oximeters and uh, blood pressure cuffs and um, other devices that are coming down the line. And by, by sending them home earlier, let's say it's a billion dollars of insurance for uh, you know the four-day stay in hospital and it's $700 million for a two-day stay in hospital with two days of monitoring. Now you have you know a $300 million budget to invest in maybe $150 million worth of stay-at-home Bluetooth devices that connect into a service provider's uh, connectivity layer. So that's saving the insurance companies, you know, $250 million then, or $150 million. So you have those kind of new models of how can we save money and patients' life is better too going home and so forth, right? So insurance-funded health and health-funded health-driven initiatives certainly seem to offer a prospect for a company to uh, connect into that particular pocket of money and it's all on the connectivity piece, right? The you know the insurance companies and the health companies aren't going to uh, they can they can ship out a gateway that has a Bluetooth hub on it, for example, and and send back information which some of the systems today can do. But if an operator actually has the ability to onboard the shipped home monitoring devices and 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 inc- and basically provide that connectivity and traceability of connection back to the operator or to the the provider, then that that would be good. The operator also has unique information about location and who the person is, so that could correlate with 
the health um, side of things to make it much more robust and secure and stable and and right 99.79 times of the time right that it is the person who's uh, who's connected. Utilities okay. similarly right so again utilities you know the model for uh, somebody who's um, energy utility right to be able to keep the HVAC uh, a degree lower um, in peak times that's a big deal right because peak usage of if you go above your your allocated energy units as a, an energy provider and have to take them from somebody else. That's a lot of money that if you can manage the your own grid um, to keep it at the, the right level all the time through opt-ins from consumers. And again, connect, connected, those thermostats connected to operators, IoT hubs. So we think that there's definitely a lot of money in that, that I think the B2B side of it is going to get bigger and bigger over the next five to ten years as operators leverage their their connectivity, their their technician fleet, right, to be able to go out and put in potential, you know, uh, acoustic uh, water water leak detectors, um, as that, that technology becomes easy to install, and you don't need to be a plumber. And so we think there's a lot of that going to happen in in the next five to ten years to leverage the the connectivity that operators have. And to John's slide here, right, the the key part of that is the new kind of gateways that we see emerging in the market, where where we see a lot of service providers, not just Look to connect on Wi-Fi, which at the moment they're, you know, they're that's their bread and butter at 90% of connects. But also now to add lower power radios, particularly we've seen a lot of movement around 802.15.4, and you know, Zigbee and Thread users, um, and Bluetooth, which is used a lot in wearables and medical devices. So we see the operators putting in that hub, basically connect to uh, make connections to new devices, and then be able to sell that connectivity, or in some cases themselves drive a vertical. Um, you know, vertical opportunity for a camera application or some other um, uh, specific smart home application, but also work with best in breed solutions. And we think the just one last thing, John. I guess I think the standard side of this is hugely important. So, uh, uh, Open Interconnect is now OCF. So that slide's a bit out of date. So the OCF group, for example, we think is a uh, is a key part of the f of the future of IoT, having an open standard that um, is supported by many many large companies. Thread is obviously another one that uh, Google have launched, and and uh, we're a member of Thread and OCF as well, right? And actually a member of all those standards. And we see all those as open on the right hand side, right? And then there's Apple's HomeKit as well, which consumers can choose to use HomeKit, and then the operator can actually also integrate with HomeKit. A um, little bit, you know, more challenging with MFI support, but the ones on the right are all open. We think that open standard will normalize the IoT onboarding onto that new device that's in the circle there. And that oper that offer offers the operator and service provider a chance to uh, onboard not just traditional Wi-Fi but also new lower power IoT devices. Okay, now Michael, who's going to control or you know who will be in charge of the user interface here? I mean, are we going to have again multiple service providers all giving their own user interface for each service, or is there an opportunity for somebody to create a kind of an overall unified user interface? And again, you know, if there is, can that be the service provider? Um, sure. So on the service provider, the interfaces that we're seeing there is relatively unified already. So you have one app from your service provider to control your lights and do the um, look at cameras, those kind of things. On the retail side, you definitely have a lot more fragmentation. Um, but in terms of what that user face it looks like right now, of course, a lot of it is the mobile device with different apps. Um, and it could be different um, different uh, categories of devices, so your light bulbs, um, your cameras, all those kind of things. But the virtual assistants kind of thing in the voice in particular is kind of maybe this unifying, kind of codifying um, interface that is going to probably be more towards the future. So Amazon, with like I said, Alexa is really pushing into this. Of course, Apple Siri onto Apple TV. Um, Google now and then potentially Cortana could all play a role into this. Um, so putting into something like voice is sometimes better than you know using your phone um, because the phone is a very personal device. So if you if it's you know some some of the family members may not have a smartphone to access it or if that person leaves the house, then control may not be as you know continuous between all the family members. Um, so if you kind of push it more towards you know the platform. Um, you could do something so to Charlton mentioned multi nodes or multi nodes in every room. Um, so if you imagine then that each room had of course this network connectivity access point, but also it could be like I say a speaker or and a microphone, then someone like a virtual assistant like Alexa could follow you as you walk around the house then. Um you know, this could you know engender some things like location based tracking and those kind of things within the home as well. Um, so those are the kind of things, but again, 
the service provider though is very well positioned just because they already have it already aggregated already. Um, so they, they're coming from an advantage point at that point. They're a little bit behind, I would say, you know, on the voice side. There are some uh, operators who are using voice for like controlling your set-top box and those kind of things. But as far as like that virtual assistant kind of thing, I would say they're not there yet, but it's something that could certainly be added. Okay, so very, very quickly, do you, how important do you think voice is? Do you think service providers really need to get into the voice game if they're not there already? I would say yes. Um, I mean, if you look at talking to, you know, like remote control uh, vendors, those voice has already been a big issue, a big growth, kind of the in vogue kind of UI right now. Um, I would say it's definitely got more potential than the voice, the hand gestures and motion uh, that we had tried out before. Um, a big thing is that the big thing is with any kind of UI is it doesn't make it more efficient um, using through that UI. So motion and gesture oftentimes wasn't very efficient. Um, but with voice, you know, if I'm watching, if I, you know, if I'm in a complete setup, I could t ask, you know, let's say Alexa to turn my light, dim my lights down, um, start the movie, um, and then you can also integrate other things, let's say like productivity and even your social networking. So if you know, a important message comes in, um, it can, you know, pause your movie, and you know, the voice assistant can say, you know, we have this important message, I can display it on your screen for you, display it on the screen, and then through again this virtual assistant, you could set appointments, um, schedule a meeting, and then if it's tied in, let's say to your, you know, DVR, it could say, well. You know, the meeting that you set for 6 p.m. is also happens to be when your favorite TV shows on. Should I set the DVR for you? So in all those kind of scenarios, that voice assistant can make everything a lot more efficient. So you don't have to go to different remotes, go to different interfaces, and that's something where it's compelling then, and something that consumers, you know, once they get into use it and understand it, it would be something that they could integrate into their daily habits. Um, where something is that maybe novel and kind of cool and exciting, but doesn't make it more efficient, they may try for a few times and then they'll just abandon it because it's easier to go back to the remote control instead of waving your hands around to try to make the screen move. Um, so I would say voice what, in that regard is definitely moving that direction, the positive direction. And what about the potential to unify the user interface for entertainment and the smart home? I mean, is that a kind of a, a pointless ambition or do you think people would appreciate having the ability to view their doorway through a channel on television or, you know, get a picture in picture pop up when the doorbell goes, something like that. I mean, is that, do you think consumers would want that or would they just want these uh, these things kept separately on another device or in another sort of interface at least? Well, I mean, all those features would be, but for some users, it'd be great. Um, for other users, they may just say it's, you know, it's intrusive to their, their viewing. So some people will want that. So it's something that would have to be an option, but certainly for lots of users, that would be a great feature. So I mean, if the doorbell rings and they can say, oh, it was just UPS who dropped the package and they left already, I don't have to get it right now, um, versus, you know, having to say, well, is this someone I don't know, or, you know, stopping and then going up. So they can make a decision and that might be something that they value. Um, so for sure, though, there's definitely opportunity. Though. I, I wouldn't say it's universal across all consumers. They are going to want it equally, but, um, Definitely, there's opportunity there, and I said there's lots of things you can do with the DVR kind of things, integrating that into the experience as well, and making it just part of your daily kind of user habit or daily daily experience, not just dedicated entertainment only. So for sure, there's definitely could be crossover points between the smart home and uh, entertainment. Okay. Okay. Well, Charles, um, we know that, you know, you've mentioned various devices from different retail companies and giants like Google. They've got devices in the shops now. They've got nice hubs, you know, uh, Amazon's voice control is very compelling. Um, so how much of a threat could that be to a service provider and their ambitions in the smart home? I mean, if these devices become, you know, commonplace and they get into the home and maybe they sit between the, the service provider gateway and the end device that that gateway would normally talk to, does that become an issue? I mean, is that going to sort of limit what a service provider could achieve in the, the gigabit home? It, it does. I think we've seen the service providers generally re react to that, John. Um, you know, the last couple of years with RFIs and RFPs, they've really been looking at um, trying to drive, um, you know, to ensure that the, the customer does not go out and buy their own router and nat them out of the service delivery, right? Because if, if you know, because of the discussion we're having about driving new services that generate new ARPU, um, the service provider knows now that, you know, you cannot force a consumer to go to uh, retail to get a 5 gigahertz capable Wi-Fi device. So obviously they've, they've switched to AC and they've started putting in, you know, 4x4s and even 8x8s are being looked at for, you know, the best possible physics in the home. So though they they recognize that as soon as somebody you know puts in one of these new C you know IoT capable Wi-Fi capable hubs, 
then they've lost the potential from the customer to uh, create that aggregation and, and a better uh, overall sort of smart and entertainment mixed experience. And to your point, I think, you know, we've been encouraging them to use the TV as a as a and a set top as well as a way of integrating that not only with the gateway and the IoT hub piece, um, but also with um, you know the ability to do things like uh, um, you know, set top with Bluetooth or RF4C, for example, is also now an IoT hub. So we can detect presence. We can uh, use the set top to um, create the secure transaction solution. Like for many of you out there who are listening or order a VOD on your set-top box. So behind that architecture, there's an authorization scheme that can also be used, for example, to approve somebody, you know, turning on and off a camera in the home for recording service, right? And having that thing securely build and shut down when you tell it to. And Michael mentioned voice support, right? So the ability when you walk into your home to say, you know, cameras off and then uh, record cameras, cameras on, right? Those type of things are frictionless, right? They're it's not a killer application per se with respect to voice, but we know voice has improved enough that it can tap into um, you know, very simple commands that make everything a little bit easier or just you know, use five or six commands that are your favorite ones to use and, and, and love them. And so more the functionality. Go ahead, John. So you need more functionality for the box. But I mean, do they need to look better as well? Because I know one of the issues is kind of, you know, in terms of Amazon and Apple, they seem to get their devices shown in the middle of the home and... Um, you know, that can improve the connectivity. I mean, do you need to make them look better as well? Yeah, we're seeing that. I mean, obviously, you know, the, there's a, the demarcation point of where the access point comes in, which tends to bias a gateway towards where the uh, the, 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 the coax fiber DSL connection is. Um, the um, ability then to produce a backhaul in-home network is a big discussion at the moment to try and get that ability for the operator to put some more devices centrally um, and so things like uh, coax, if it's there, have been uh, heavily used in, in the U.S. particularly. And the 2.5 gig Mocha 2.5 standard is available to really drive a high backbone in the home to allow gigabit speeds over coax and existing wearing, wearing. We've seen that we've seen an improvement in Ethernet as well. So rather than go to 10 gig backbones, which is a little bit too early in the home, 2.5 gig seems about right. There's new standards, NBase T802.3 BZ, that is allowing a more affordable 2.5 gig connection in the home in the future. And then, as you said, John, the ability to put satellite devices um, that look nice, non-obtrusive, um, and that you want to engage with, particularly if you're trying to do voice and audio services, right? Those things, because they're audio boxes in the case of, say, an Amazon Echo, it has to be put out quite prominent. So so we, we're we're also seeing a push from the operators to spend a little bit more money to um, to make a, a nicer uh, device where the customer can engage with in the future. Still trying to figure out exactly where all that stuff goes, um, you know, all-in-one versus distributed devices and a combination of both, I think. Um, but certainly, you know, moving, as you said, to, uh, you know, devices that the user will engage with more. And the set-top similarly, right? They, um, they've kind of been disappearing behind behind TVs, they've been coming back in front again. You know, there's, there's certainly, um, you know, the ergonomics of how consumers put their devices is, is a key part of what the service providers are having companies like Aris really drive and, and try and see if we can come up with a good solution for them. Okay. Well, I know we've touched upon money a few times now, like where money could come from, but let's just return to that, that theme because it's obviously crucial. And Michael, I mean, in terms of entertainment, uh, if you have gigabit capability and you can push gigabit speeds right through to every corner of the house, I mean, what could that achieve you in terms of revenues? I mean, is it just about customer loyalty and reducing churn as always, or could you create some sort of new revenues out of that? Um, I mean, for the service provider, I mean, some of them now are, they're also, they're also looking at going over the top. In, in conjunction with their traditional platform TV services. So having more robust, you know, networks within the home allows more viewers to view those streams simultaneously. Um, so that's one way that, you know, selling the more robust network and their services go hand in hand. Um, but also just being prepared and ready for a lot of the new things that are coming. So, you know, we mentioned 4K, virtual reality, and all those kind of things. So, um, but if you look at just just entertainment in general, I think most of the revenue, of course, is coming from these OTT services. Um, VR, 
because of the nature of the number of, I would say the more limited number of devices out there, it's not going to be as big revenue-wise, of course, as the overall OTT space. Um, but it's something that for those households that do have the VR H&Ds or headsets, that, that could be a big part of their entertainment budget, um, whether it's gaming or video. But, okay. you know, 4K, yeah. multiple screens. Oh, go ahead. No, sorry, finish off. No, I was going to say 4K is, is still more, you know, the primary screen, and that's right now probably be a little bit more geared towards, right now a little bit OTT just because it's available, but eventually they'll probably be more towards the traditional pay TV services just by the nature of, the, you know, what's available out there. But. Okay. Now, I've just put a, a slide on the screen, which is yours, Charles, and it's uh, showing really sort of devices, smart devices that would gain the most acceptance, and this obviously lead, leads to revenue. So just talk us through this and the next slide fairly quickly. Yeah, so uh, you know, everybody's looking for the business case for smart home, and you know it's it's pretty straightforward. I think it's uh, you know what devices do people really want to manage, which is the ones to focus on if you're a service provider and want to offer the smallest possible, simplest to use, and you know sticky pack of of devices. And as we pulled, um, I very I have the U.S. data as well, but uh, this is the European view of it. The countries we pulled, right, and the U.S. is similar, right? The and the rest of the world actually is similar. The, um, the, the, the main applications that people are looking for when they think of smart home are cameras for, for peace of mind security, not 24 by 7 surveillance security, but peace of mind security, being able to get, e get emails when someone is in the house or moving and, and watch the dog and so forth. Motion sensors coupled with that. And then thermostats for just general en energy control and the convenience of setting control and then lights as well. Um, alarms are kind of tied into that peace of mind security. So they're, they're, they're kind of the five kind of areas that either are over 30% adoptions. That's what the chart, the candlestick shows, right? The percentage of acceptance that the, in each of those countries for those particular devices. So they're, they're the five things to get right and to put together in a cost-effective manner uh, for smart home. And then the next slide I showed is the, is the money slide, John, right? In that Again, I put this in a European context or, or, or any U.S. colleagues on the phone. Uh, the number in the U.S., by the way, is $14.10. Um, so when we polled um, last year in our CEI poll, um, all these countries and asked, how much would you be willing to pay for a, you know, those five kind of devices uh, on a monthly basis running in your home? The numbers range from Russia at about 729 euros to 10.59 in Spain euros. And fourteen dollars ten, as I said in the U.S., um, fourteen dollars in Brazil as well, for example. So the the, uh, the willingness to pay is the key part. So if you can if you can sell a smart home peace of mind solution at say ten dollars a month, ten euros a month to make the math simple, that's one hundred and twenty dollars or hundred euros of capex investment for a one year ROI. Now you know five years ago that would have been impossible with cameras, thermostats, and and sensors, but with technology and with the advance in silicon and the advance in being able to manufacture these new end devices a lot cheaper, you can actually build out multiple cameras, multiple sensors, a camera thermostat package, all within a one-year ROI on a hundred euro capex investment, and that's a key part now, right? So you know, people are not as willing to pay 39.95 for a you know, security 24-hour surveillance smart home, that's a tougher uh, chunk of money to take out of the budget each month. But at $10, you ramp them in on the first four device, devices, and then you can upsell uh, new services as they get their new connected dishwashers or whatever. And if there's some value add you can add there. Um, so we think it's all about the money and the four, four or five devices to target. You put that together as your basis of your strategy, and you throw some, some darts at it. We think that's the one... That works, and obviously, then the key part is to minimise the cost of the hub. So rather than go out and getting a separate hub, you know, for all these different devices, if you integrate the hub directly in a next generation uh, gateway, DOCSIS Fibre DSL, you then reduce the capex of the hub piece to a very substantial lower amount, right? Which makes the whole uh, one-year ROI feasible still then. So is there a is there a, a sort of ceiling that you already know in terms of how much people would pay on smart services? I mean, obviously we can see there what they will pay for automation, but there could be other services come along. And does anybody have an idea of just how much revenue is sitting on the table if we make services compelling enough and they look like we need them enough? 
Um, I, 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 it's pure guess on our part. We've, we've actually surveyed the willingness to pay above, you know, 40, uh, willingness to not pay at all. So there's obviously a sticky bunch of people. It's about 16% of people that wouldn't pay anything at all, right, through education, just worry privacy or whatever. There's about 7% of people who have maybe a little bit too much money that they'll pay way above $40 for the convenience factor. Um, and then there's the rest of us, right, where um, I think I think intuitively everybody listening in this phone call would say that if, if a service provider technician came to your house to put in a new de- next generation gigabit gateway with better Wi-Fi and a new HDR 4K set top, and while they were there said to you, would you like me to put in... Uh, you know, for ten dollars a month, a uh, you know four cameras, two cameras, a thermostat, or whatever the, the mix is, um, and it's only ten dollars per month. Um, that qu- question at ten dollars is gets a much higher reception if you poll a thousand Aris employees versus if you say thirty nine ninety five a month. So we we think it's we think it's summer get them started at ten and then layer on new services. So for for example, cameras, right? People don't generally turn on the 995 camera recording service that's advertised with many retail devices. The percentage of takers, I would guess, is, say, 10%, but the, the, the CE guys can tell me I'm, I'm wrong. Um, but if you if you have a camera that's turned on when you're on vacation, the acceptance and willingness to pay for that is 50% or more, right? Um, if you have the camera and you want to just... If it's a you know if it's five euros for two weeks vacation recording or fifty euros is a difference there. So generally, you know you can upsell things like camera recording once you get the camera in there. But without the camera, you can't even touch on being able to get that extra you know one dollar to fifty dollars of recording service. Okay, and Michael, I mean, if you know putting putting direct revenues aside, I mean, how valuable would this be if we call it the fifth play? How valuable would that be in terms of uh, stickiness and reducing churn? I mean, is it a massive churn buster if you rely on the same service provider for so many things? Yeah, so we talked about some of the, the stickiness. Like I said, a lot of the pro- once you have those things installed, you're used to using it, it's going to keep you in that service. Um, but in terms of, you know, uh, you know, if you want to talk about other, bringing other customers like that, it's also just, one having the convenience, but also being able to show you know other friends and family the kind of features that you have messed up too as well. So all those kind of things kind of I would say feed off on each other to you know keep customers in, keep and bring other new customers in as well. Um, so for sure, there's definitely um, a stickiness to it. Okay, great. All right. Well, we'll just finish off with a couple of um, audience questions very quickly. Uh, I'll direct them both to you, Charles. They're fairly technical. I just need uh, thirty second answers. So the first one is. Um, what about legacy equipment? Um, how will the provider deal with that? Does he need to replace all old equipment? So if we're talking about gateways, I guess, is it a brand new generation? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, in many ways it, it probably is, right? You can't get, if you don't have um, an AC device, if you don't have 4x4, four four, you can't really get you know, blazing speeds. Um, I think our service providers in Aris have done a great job of, of providing a brilliant service on, you know, incremental technology from, you know, 802.11n to dual band AC to now 3x3 being the standard mark with 4x4 giving you gigabit Wi-Fi bragging rights and then um, higher speeds even achievable with future AX, as we said. So um, we think that that's, um, you, can't, you can't beat physics, right? And then the software pieces, I think, can be, Used. There, there is some potential around some of the, the current generation devices that are shipping have really good ability to give Wi-Fi information back to um, a product like our Eco product where we do Wi-Fi analytics. So we can still, I think, leverage you know, the current 3x3s three that have been sent out there. The Silicon guys are doing a, a better job of, of giving us information to give the cloud. So we may be able to do some uh, software-based improvements on um, on Wi-Fi, particularly around even sensing if the, if the customer needs an extender. Okay, let me ask this last one before we run out of time. This is uh, no name to this one, but what about SDN and NFV aspects? Are they of importance in the implementation? Again, it's a 30-second answer, please. Uh, yes, yes, they are. I think we've, we've actually looked at the implication on the hardware. So the hardware actually doesn't really drop down much in terms of a gateway power because 
a lot of these soft switches still require the grunt that we currently have today. But we do believe there's obviously, as I said, there's a controller in the gateway which does really low latency client steering. And then the cloud plays a huge part in managing Wi-Fi intra-home and across homes. And it does fit well into, say, a VCPE or VAP architecture. So being able to virtualize some of that functionality to the cloud, um, and probably in baby steps, right, developing first a really good cloud, cloud remote resource management solution and then SDNizing that in the future is probably the, the way to go there. Okay, great stuff. All right. Well, we're out of time, and um, so thank you, everybody, for listening, and thanks especially to Charles and Michael for uh, for being on the panel. It's very informative. I hope you found it uh, worthwhile. So um, uh, have a great afternoon, and um, thanks for your time. Thank you, John. Thank you.